you guys can make your way out to the door back there, uh, and they will get you where you need to go. Uh, if you're going to stay in here with us today, we'll do a couple of announcements. Uh, youth, right, tonight was going to be uh, your uh, kind of end of the year uh, cookout, uh, but just due to weather, and actually because Kate and Lou got sick overnight, uh, it's been canceled. We're going to reschedule that for some time a little bit later on in the summer, okay? So you guys, youth, no, no meeting today. Fourth and fifth grade, you guys were going to meet later on this afternoon, but again, because bad weather's moving in, you're going to meet here uh, in the church right after church. So, you know, we'll all kind of stand around and talk and, and do what we normally do, and then after we clear out, you guys are going to do your cookout uh, right here in the church right afterwards. Uh, if you'd remember, right, Father's Day is coming up, June 20th, next Sunday, right? Come celebrate worship with Dad. We'll have some gifts to give out to dads, just like we do to moms. Uh, there'll be a uh, last chance for, for this year to do a, a family photo, if you would like to do one. Cindy will be set up upstairs in the chapel up there. You can get a family picture, right? If you'd like one for the directory, uh, you can do that. That'll be the last chance, because uh, we're moving into summer. Uh, but those will be coming up next Sunday, too, Father's Day. Uh, VBS. July 11th, I got the numbers last night, uh, and we already have over 80 kids registered, right? So uh, we are somewhat capping it this year, right, in the number of kids per age level. So if you haven't had a chance to register yet, I would highly advise you to do that, like, today, because uh, we may be full here soon. So if you would like to help, though I don't see it back here, normally the, the donation board is back there in the back. It'll be up for the next several weeks uh, that you guys can grab stuff. Uh, and maybe bring in some donations to help out uh, with VBS. All right, good. That should be it for today. Uh, we're, we're doing our sermon series. Sorry, my mouth is really dry today. I don't know why. Sermon series today. Uh, this week, we're, we're asking the question, okay, how do you live a life pleasing to God? Right? Like, how do we, you know, we spent all this time, like 15 months walking through uh, the, the New City Catechism and, and kind of looking at what's the kind of the core of the content of our belief. But now we're asking the question, okay, given that this is what we believe, how do we go out and live? How do you go out and, and, and be on the boat that you're on? Uh, or perhaps in, in the office or wherever you might be, in the home, in your school, right? How do you live a life uh, that's pleasing to God. And, and we've talked about several things over the past several weeks. One of the things we said is a, a, an authentic Christian life, right? A, a life pleasing to God is a very, it's a quiet life. And that's so countercultural. But it's, it's a life where we're called to, to love our church home, where we're called just to kind of mind our own business and, and be in our own place and to work diligently. And we're also called to think Christianly, right? That this is what we talked about last week, that our minds should be filled with thoughts that are pure and are lovely and are just and are honorable. And as I was thinking through, you know, okay, this is really our, our series for June. Like, what else should we talk about here? I didn't have this, I didn't have, unlike normal series, right? I didn't have this one actually mapped out exactly how I want to go. If you'll, if you'll know me, I'm, I'm kind of a planner when it comes to that stuff, but... Uh, Perhaps 52 weeks of knowing exactly what was, was coming just kind of put me in the other direction, right? Like, I'm just going to wing it. Uh, but I'm really asking the Spirit, like, what, what do we need right now? Like, what is the church, our church, right? And, but, but yet the church, like, if we look at our moment in time and our moment in history, like, what do we need the church to be? Uh, and as I was thinking on that and praying on that this week, the Spirit led me to the simple answer, guys, we need peacemakers. Like, we need peacemakers. Uh, the world, I mean, it is not a place of peace right now. And, and the simple reality is, is it never has been, except for one brief time. But, and it's almost like, you know, here we are in America, and we're insulated by these two great oceans on either side of us, right? So we, we very, very infrequently have conflict on our continent. And, and, and in the last 30-something years, right, if you remember, like I'm old enough to remember now, like 1989 when, when the, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed, right, and the United States kind of great adversary went under. Uh, 
And there was this kind of sense of relief. And that was 33 years ago. And it's even been 22 years, like the last kind of, that I could think of, big event, 9-11, right? It was, do you realize, guys, 9-11 was now 22 years ago? 22 years ago. And so we've been living in this era of, I'm not going to call it peace because it's not, but a lack of conflict to a degree. And in February, that was somewhat shattered, right, by Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. I say it was an illusion of peace because it wasn't really, not things, stuff didn't maybe affect us as directly, but there's been no end of conflict in the world. There's still religious conflict, right? There's, there's conflict between Muslims and Christians and Hindus. There's still conflict, right, between even Christian denominations, right, over liberal denominations and conservative denominations. There's even conflict within individual churches, Right? There's been conflict economically you know, between socialism and capitalism, this clash of ideologies. There's growing conflict, it seems now, in, in at least what looks to me, the way our world is going to kind of reorganize itself between the United States and Europe and Australia and perhaps China and Russia. Right? And we're going to kind of resettle into two different power blocks that are at least going to be in some kind of cold conflict. There's racial tension and conflict. There's family conflict, there's arguments in marriage, even good marriages, right? There's broken families. We have this psychological conflict, right? Anxiety, depression, bipolar, gender confusion. American culture has turned into anger culture, outrage culture, rage at everything that just comes at us through this 24-hour news cycle. There's mass shootings that have ticked up. There was an armed gunman outside of Supreme Court Justice's house. Like, it's not peaceful. And it hasn't always been that way. Part of the truth of the Bible is that God actually created a world uh, of peace. In the beginning, when, when God created, right, the heavens and the earth, and, and he looked around at, at all of it, and planets and stars and, and all this kind of stuff, and God looks at it and goes, and this is really good. This is good. Very good. Listen to what he says in Genesis chapter 1. It'll be up on the screen going into chapter 2. This is the end of the story of creation. And God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. And thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he'd done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. At the end of creation, God looks out over the universe. And he says, man, look at this. It's a beautiful place. And it's good. And all that stuff that we just talked about, it wasn't here. It was tranquil. And it was pleasant. Right? Everything was, was in order. The man and the woman, they existed peacefully. There was no arguing, right? When, when Eve said, where do you want to go for dinner? And, and Adam said, I don't care. He, he really meant, I don't care, right? There was no anger. Why? Because they served one another perfectly, unselfishly. There was no misunderstanding. And if there was, they were able to work through it in, in absolutely person-honoring and God-honoring ways. There wasn't any uncertainty as to who they were and why they were there. There was no anxiety, right? They, they weren't nervous about anything. And the world was quiet and calm and good. But it doesn't stay that way, right? We know the story, right? The, the peace of God's creation is, is destroyed or you know, may, maybe better said, interrupted when, when an enemy comes in and disguises himself as a serpent and tempts and tricks. And listen to what it says. Now, the servant was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. This is in Genesis 3. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said, you're not going to die. 
God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that it was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desired to, be make, to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. There's a lot of different ways you can look at this, okay? There is so much, but one of the things that you can see here, what Satan does is he comes and he introduces conflict. Conflict. He introduces uncertainty. Did God really say that? Into a, an environment where they had been certain. And Eve goes, I don't know. That's, that's what Adam told me, right? The serpent says, you're going to be like God. You can make a jump. And he goes, you're not going to die. That's not true. Right? All these elements of conflict, uncertainty, distrust, self-centeredness, greed, all of it comes in. Since that moment, it's been, the world's been characterized by conflict. Conflict between the woman and the serpent, conflict between the woman and the man. If you move on to Genesis 4, right, you've got the account of Cain and Abel, and, and, and Cain kills his brother. And, and my point of going back through all this is I want you guys to see, right, the world has never been a place of peace, but it's into this world that God calls his people, and here's how this all connects, to be peacemakers. Matthew 5, 9, this is the core verse, There's two core verses of today, if you want to jot these down in your notebooks, right? Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God, the children of God. Jesus says, listen, folks, God looks down and smiles and blesses those that stand in his world that's filled with all kinds of conflict and work for peace. A life pleasing to God, a life dedicated to seeking peace and working for peace. Authentic Christians are, in fact, peacemakers. And it doesn't come naturally because sin and Satan and all this mess keeps getting in the way and stirring up trouble. Peace isn't found, right? It, it doesn't just happen. It has to be made. I mean, do you notice what Jesus says, right? He doesn't look out at his followers and go, blessed are the peacekeepers, as if it's something that might pop up or something that might happen, and we just have to manage it. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, blessed are the peace finders, as if it's, as if it's out there somewhere. And if, if we just go right to this, this right place at right time and right moment, that, that we can actually discover it. No. Jesus says peace must be made, and it takes work and effort and time and energy. And Christians, right, Jesus looks at his people and says, blessed are you if you are a peacemaker. And you say, okay, how do I do that? What do I need to do to become a peacemaker? If you flip in your Bibles uh, to the book of James, James chapter 1, I'm going to read you a couple of verses. This is really, if, if I look at my own life, this is kind of my life verse, right? Verse 19, James 1, 19. If you've been in church at any, you know, any length of time, it's going to be familiar. But James is, you know, James is actually the half-brother of Jesus, right? This is the James that's leading the, the Jerusalem church in, in the book of Acts. Uh, I've always thought to myself, James is kind of like one of the best apologetics for the deity of Christ. You know what I mean by apologetics? One of the best defenses for the deity of Christ, right? So how, like how hard would it be to convince your sibling that you're actually God, right? The fact that James turns up and goes, yeah, my brother, like he's God, that's a pretty strong argument. I mean, I think back, my, you know, my brother, he's, he's a good guy, but if he walked up to me and said, you know, I'm really the Lord, be like, yeah, I don't think so, right? So, you got the half-brother of Jesus, who's now the leader of the church. But listen to what he says. He says, know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness 
and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. James is telling the church how to live out your faith, and he tells you three ways in this, three ways that ultimately, though he doesn't say it exactly like this right here, but that will lead you to be a peacemaker. Number one, that you are quick to listen. You are quick to listen. And and in two, two aspects of this, right? First, that you are quick to listen to the Lord. You might want to write that down. It's not on your outline up there, but you are quick to listen to the Lord, right? A life pleasing to God is characterized by a desire to hear from him. The phrase quick to listen primarily means that they are looking, right, that that followers of Jesus are looking for ways and opportunities to hear from him. That's what this whole thing's about, right? He's like quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, right? Therefore, put away filthiness, wickedness, and receive the implanted word. Right? Get all this stuff out of the way. Get, get a lack of listening, get too much talking, get anger, get filthy, get all of it out of the way so that you can hear from God and he can implant his word in you. Peacemaking begins, church, with a hunger to hear from God. They are quick, authentic Christians are are quick so that the gospel implants in our hearts and not only just saves us, right, but goes beyond that, right? Do we understand, do we understand that when it comes to making peace, right, that, that it's listening to the Lord and being able to hear the Lord that's going to get us there, we're not gonna find it on our own. We're not going to find it by doing it the way we think it ought to be done. Right? It's the wisdom of the Lord. It's the commands of the Lord. It's the love of the Lord. It's the patience of the Lord. It's all that that seeps into our hearts and minds and changes us so that we can then take the Lord, right, and his ways and go out and make peace. The only way you can know that is to have it planted in you and be quick to listen. But we're quick to listen to God, but we're also quick. Here's a sub point under quick to hear. Quick to listen to the Lord, quick to listen to other people. Other people. Some of the best advice that I've heard, and I don't remember where I heard it. Read it, heard it. Probably came from multiple places. You have two ears and one tongue. Use them in that proportion. You listen twice as much as you speak. Peacemakers are quick to hear, and they really listen. They don't just listen to reply, right? You, you, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody who you, you know, you can tell, right, that they are just listening to respond, and they're already kind of thinking about what they're going to say, and they're ready to just pounce as soon as you take a breath? They're quick to hear. They're slow to speak. They listen to understand, right? You're you're listening for that other person to to fully express themselves. They ask questions to clarify. They're slow to speak. They ask and then they listen again. They don't interrupt. They're less focused on maybe how the other person speaks than what they're actually trying to communicate. Those that are quick to listen, are you are trying to cut through and, and just take any misunderstandings, right, and slide them out of the way so that you can get like, what is this person trying to communicate? Maybe they're not doing it well, but how do I listen and give them the benefit of the doubt? You're trying to understand where the other person's coming from why they believe what they believe, or why they think that way. And you're doing your best not to get offended. You've got to shut down. That We've all got this like inner lawyer inside of us, right, that immediately begins issuing our defenses. We've got to shove him out of the way. Peacemakers, guys, we are quick to hear from the Lord, and we are quick to listen to other people. And it's only then can we even set the table for us to begin to speak. You with me? We're quick to hear, but we're also slow to speak. You guys ever go to like uh, like fairs or uh, you know if you go to like downtown Boston or I I can remember when we were my family was younger we went 
uh, vacation one summer, we went down to New Orleans, right? And in the big square there, right, they have the people that draw the caricatures. You know what I'm talking about? Right? They'll, you know, you can sit there and they'll draw you or, or, or you can buy one or whatever. Uh, if we asked one of those guys, in, at least in my mind, to draw a caricature of, of the average American, uh, here's what I think it would look like. It would have this huge head and kind of tiny body, right? And on that head, right, the mouth is enormous. And the ears are tiny. Right? And it, in my mind, right, you guys can come up with your own mental image, but he's dressed kind of like a gunslinger. Like the Western, right? Got the cowboy hat on, got the vest, got the chaps, got the boots. Holding in, in, out of his holster, instead of a pistol, an iPhone. And instead of bullets coming out of that phone, it's the little Twitter signs, right? That are just floating up. It's what I imagine, right? We are slow to listen and quick to fire off some tweets. And it's almost, I mean, gosh, God, you watch, and it's almost like who can draw the fastest if something happens and get off the quickest tweet to, to approve or condemn or, you're right? And then, oh my gosh, only to find out a week or a month or a year later that, ooh, we didn't know it all, right? We didn't have all the facts. How many times, right, have, have you spouted off about something only to learn five minutes later or, or an hour later that, ah, I didn't have all the facts, right? Think about, right, that, that, that time in your own life when someone has said something to spouse or child or friend and it's rubbed you the wrong way and you fired off in sarcasm only to find out that's not what they meant. Christian, we are quick to listen, we are patient to listen, and we're slow to speak, and that's not popular. It's not what's in vogue. It is not self-assertive enough. It is not uh, activist enough, right? Being the one that, is, that listens to people and absorbs and hears and listens to God and digests it and finally speaks is not the cool thing. Got to be quick on the draw. But guys, it'll help make peace. Christians are quick to hear and they're slow to speak. Now, I want to issue this qualification. Slow to speak does not mean never to speak. Jesus said, you'll have opportunities. You'll have opportunities to speak in front of kings. You'll have opportunities to speak in front of governors, in front of businesses, in front of friends. And when it comes time, you are to speak. And the Spirit will help you. And after we've listened and after we've understood, then we're duty-bound to speak the truth in love. And some of us or we're scared to do that, right? Because of what it might cost. Uh, one of the most fascinating books I've read in the last year, it's, just, it's a guy named uh, Chris Bale, right? It's called Breaking the Social Media Prism, uh, How to Make Our Platforms Less Polarizing. Chris Bale is a professor of sociology uh, and public policy down at Duke University, not a Christian, uh, but he runs what's called their polarization lab, which studies political polarization, okay? Uh, the central thesis of the book, if you're into this kind of stuff, is that our social media platforms, which are, are highly polarized, right, are driven and dominated by the extremes of both sides. Okay, the extreme left, the extreme right. And we tend to think about, right, and social media platforms tend to try to make us think that they are, in fact, reflections of, of what America looks like. They're more like a mirror. Right, but Chris's thesis and what their work at Duke basically says uh, is that it's less like a mirror and more like a prism. The light doesn't bounce off and come back and display exactly what's in front of it, but instead it gets bent and refracted and twisted. And Now, the analogy breaks down because prisms actually produce things that are really beautiful, right? But not so much in social media. But anyway, so what he says, I want to read you this quote. It's on page, page 106, kind of continuing into page 107. And I'll connect it to what we're talking about. But this is towards the end of the book. He's, he's, he's wrapping up. He says, this research provide a warning 
to those of you who regularly share information about politics on social media. Now, again, his, his, his area is particularly politics. But I believe it's most important that the most important distortion the social media prism creates is through those who, like Sarah or Derek, they're both kind of moderates that he talked about from earlier in the book, who don't post about politics at all. As I argued in chapter 6, the lack of moderate voices on social media may contribute more to political polarization than the abundance of extremists on our platforms. Because the absence of the former enables the latter to hijack the public conversation. You follow me when I said that? The lack of people in the middle talking enables the far left and the far right to hijack. Okay, that's what he's saying. He goes on down at the bottom. And this is what he's, he's arguing. He says, but all of us must carefully balance the desire to preserve our self-image with the consequences of these choices for the public good. We all need to think carefully about the issues we consider to be important enough to weigh in on. Moderate people need to decide which issues are so important to them they, they will not allow extremists to speak on their behalf. We all need to balance our desire not to upset friends, family members, or colleagues with the urgent need to beat back polarization on our platforms. Now you say, how does that kind of connect? Do you understand what he's saying? Now he's specifically talking about politics, but he makes a biblical point. We need to listen. We need to think. We need to weigh carefully when we speak. And he's talking about social media, but we need to speak. He's saying there is a portion of our population in our country that is silent on social media, and he makes great arguments as to why that is, because, you know, you, you go on and you post something and, and you get hammered by, you know, the, the Twitter lynch mob or something like that, right? He, he argues as, as to why that actually happens, but he says you should be slow to speak, but you have to speak. He's making a biblical point, guys, not a Christian, not studying Christian things, but recognizing that the way the system is set up here is that it's broken, and we need those people that listen and speak to actually say something. James is making the same argument. Quick to listen, slow to speak, but slow to speak doesn't mean never to speak. Sometimes you got to say something, right? You've got to use your wisdom and discernment and discretion that you get from taking in what the Lord is telling you, but there comes a time where you must speak. That's what being a peacemaker is. It's not just going to happen. We think if we kind of sit back and just absorb and, and let it all happen that maybe peace will reorganize itself and go, but Jesus says, no, I'm sending my people out to go and be peacemakers, quick to listen, slow to speak, last, slow to get angry. Oh, and this is, this is the one that kind of hit me like a freight train. Because I, I, I've, I've told you guys multiple times, right? You can read the Bible over and over and over and over and over again, and the Spirit can bring something new out every single time. I've always thought when I read this, cause like I said, this is kind of my life verse, right? Kyle, shut up, listen more, talk less, don't get as mad. Like this, this is what, like, over and over to me. For the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. I've always thought that means in me, right, that my anger is not going to produce God's righteousness, that I'm not going to become more Christ-like by getting angry. And that's true. That's true. Jesus, he got angry every now and then, but it was rare. And it was because God was dishonored and the temple was being misused, not because Caesar made a demand or he just didn't seem to care about it. Right? Jesus was an oasis of calm and peace, but my natural desire is to shoot first and ask questions later. Right? I, I, I should expect that my anger is going to move me farther away from God, and that's absolutely true. But it's also, and this is what I didn't see, the anger of man is also not going to produce the righteousness of God in other people. And this is where it's like, ah. Because, I mean, think about it. Anger, anger doesn't change minds. You notice this about our culture? Our, our culture is amazingly angry, but nobody is changing. All the tweet storms and, and all the 
all this stuff. Why? Because we have huge mouths and tiny little ears and nobody's listening. We're all just yelling at each other. But nobody changes. And listen to me, guys. This is where the church can make a difference. Right? This is where we can be the people sent out by Jesus and we can speak from a place of love, not a place of anger. And we do that by listening and understanding and speaking. Being peacemakers is not the, the wishy-washy kind of peacemaking that maybe one side of the church does by just jettisoning everything that would perhaps cause conflict until there's nothing left, right? Nor is it the peace that the, the, the right side of the church or another side in, in kind of the culture war and the crusading for the truth and, and to force peace. No, it's not either one of those. It's taking the wisdom of God and listening to people and then going out, speaking. We speak slowly. We don't get angry. But listen, can you imagine a church like that? What will produce righteousness in other people? Listening to them, understanding them, and then speaking lovingly and respectfully, thoughtfully. Is it going to work every time? No. But that's what we need. When we take the content of what we believe and how we should live that out, Guys, this is, the church can do amazing, you can do amazing things in your school, on, in your office, on your boat, like wherever you might be, on the basketball court. Go live quietly in our little corner of Connecticut. It's a quiet corner of Connecticut. Think deeply about relationships and work and social issues and all this stuff. Seek peace, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. For you will be called sons of and daughters of God. I'm going to pray for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this group of people that are sitting in here today and for those that are out online that are listening. Lord, I pray for those that maybe aren't feeling well today that, that might tune in uh, at some time later this week or those that might be traveling, God. And I pray that you will help us to be a peacemaking church and that you will send us out as people that are quick to listen, slow to speak, and Lord, and slow to get angry. Help us to understand that the opposite of that, that slow to listen and fast to speak and, and just the anger that everything induces is never going to lead us to your righteousness, nor will it lead us to help and change others. Father, give us a desire to come and hear from you, not just in church on Sundays, but in times with you on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Speak to us, Lord, through sermons, through Bible studies, through devotional hours, through prayer times, through conversations with, with other Christians. Lord, speak and let us take your wisdom and go out into your world and be peacemakers until that time that you decide to send Jesus back and this world once again becomes a place characterized by peace. Until then, Lord, bless us as we seek to go out and be peacemakers. We pray all this uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. God bless you, church. Uh, God keep you. Uh, God make his face to shine upon you. God be gracious to you and give you his peace. Amen. We'll see you next time. Take the chairs and set them over to